Rats by M.R. James. Read by James Mayo. And if you was to walk through the bedrooms now, you'd see the ragged, moldy bedclothes a heaving and a heaving like seas. And a heaving and a heaving with what? he says. Why, with the rats under em. But was it with the rats? I ask, because in another case it was not. I cannot put a date to the story, but I was young when I heard it, and the teller was old. It is an ill-proportioned tale, but that is my fault, not his. It happened in Suffolk, near the coast, in a place where the road makes a sudden dip and then a sudden rise. As you go northward, at the top of that rise, stands a house on the left of the road. It is a tall red brick house, narrow for its height. Perhaps it was built around 1770. The top of the front has a low triangular pediment with a round window in the centre. Behind it are stables and offices, and such garden as it has is behind them. Scraggy Scotch firs are near it. An expanse of gorse-covered land stretches away from it. It commands a view of the distant sea from the upper windows of the front. A sign on a post stands before the door, or did so stand, for though it was an inn of repute once, I believe it is so no longer. To this inn came my acquaintance, Mr. Thompson, when he was a young man, on a fine spring day, coming from the University of Cambridge, and desirous of solitude, intolerable quarters, and time for reading. These he found for the landlord and his wife had been in service and could make a visitor comfortable, and there was no one else staying at the inn. He had a large room on the first floor, commanding the road and the view, if it faced east. Why, that could not be helped. The house was well built and warm. He spent very tranquil and uneventful days, work all the morning, an afternoon perambulation of the country round, a little conversation with country company or the people of the inn in the evening over the then fashionable drink of brandy and water, a little more reading and writing and bed. And he would have been content that this should continue for the full month he had at disposal. So well was his work progressing, and so fine was the April of that year, which I have reason to believe was that which Orlando Whistlecraft chronicles in his second record as the charming year. One of his walks took him along the northern road, which stands high and traverses a wide common called a heath. On the bright afternoon, when he first chose this direction, his eye caught a white object some hundreds of yards to the left of the road, and he felt it necessary to make sure what this might be. It was not long before he was standing by it, and found himself looking at a square block of white stone, fashioned somewhat like the base of a pillar, with a square hole in the upper surface. Just such another you may see this day on Thetford Heath. After taking stock of it, he contemplated for a few minutes the view, which offered a church tower or two, some red roofs of cottages and windows winking in the sun, and the expanse of sea, also with an occasional wink and gleam upon it, and so pursued his way. In the desultory evening talk in the bar, he asked why the white stone was there on the common. An old-fashioned thing, that is, said the landlord, Mr. Betts. We was none of us alive when it was put there. That's right, said another. It stands pretty high, said Mr. Thompson. I dare say a sea mark was on it some time back. Ah, yes, Mr. Betts agreed. I have heard they could see it from the boats. But whatever there was, it fell to bits this long time. Good job, too, said a third. Torn to lucky mark. But what the old men used to say, not lucky for the fishing, I mean to say. Why ever not, said Thompson. 
Well, I never used to see it myself, was the answer. But they had some funny ideas, what I mean, peculiar, them old chaps, and I should wonder but what they made away with it themselves. It was impossible to get anything clearer than this. The company, never very voluble, fell silent, and when next someone spoke, it was of village affairs and crops. Mr. Betts was the speaker. Not every day did Thompson consult his health by taking a country walk. One very fine afternoon found him busily writing at three o'clock. Then he stretched himself and rose, and walked out of his room into the passage. Facing him was another room, then the stairhead, then two more rooms, one looking out to the back and the other to the south. At the south end of the passage was a window, to which he went, considering to himself that it was rather a shame to waste such a fine afternoon. However, work was paramount just at the moment. He thought he would just take five minutes off and go back to it, and those five minutes he would employ. The Betzes could not possibly object to looking at the other rooms in the passage, which he had never seen. Nobody at all, it seemed, was indoors. Probably, as it was market day, they were all gone to the town, except perhaps a maid in the bar. Very still the house was, and the sun shone really hot. Early flies buzzed in the window panes, so he explored. The room facing his was undistinguished, except for an old print of Bury St. Edmund's. The two next him, on his side of the passage, were gay and clean, with one window apiece, whereas his had two. Remained the southwest room, opposite to the last which he had entered. This was locked, but Thompson was in a mood of quite indefensible curiosity, and feeling confident that there could be no damaging secrets in a place so easily got at, he proceeded to fetch the key of his own room, and when that did not answer, to collect the keys of the other three. One of them fitted, and he opened the door. The room had two windows looking south and west, so it was as bright and the sun as hot upon it as it could be. Here there was no carpet, but bare boards, no pictures, no washing stand, only a bed in the farther corner, an iron bed, with mattress and bolster, covered with a bluish check counterpane, as featureless a room as you can well imagine, and yet there was something that made Thompson close the door again very quickly, and yet quietly behind him and lean against the window sill in the passage, actually quivering all over. It was this, that under the counterpane someone lay, and not only lay, but stirred, that it was some one and not some thing was certain, because the shape of a head was unmistakable on the bolster, and yet it was all covered, and no one lies with covered head but a dead person, and this was not dead, not truly dead, because it heaved and shivered, if he had seen these things in dusk, or by the light of a flickering candle, Thompson could have comforted himself and talked of fancy. On this bright day, that was impossible. What was to be done? First lock the door at all costs. Very gingerly he approached it, and bending down, listened, holding his breath. Perhaps there might be a sound of heavy breathing and a prosaic explanation. There was absolute silence. But as, with a rather tremulous hand, he put the key into its hole and turned it, it rattled, and on the instant a stumbling padded tread was heard coming towards the door. Thompson fled like a rabbit to his room and locked himself in. Futile enough, he knew it was. Would doors and locks be any obstacle to what he suspected? But it was all he could think of at the moment, and in fact nothing happened. Only there was a time of acute suspense, followed by a misery of doubt as to what to do. The impulse, of course, was to slip away as soon as possible from a house which contained such an inmate, but only the day before he had said he should be staying for at least a week more. 
and how, if he changed plans, could he avoid the suspicion of having pried into places where he certainly had no business? Moreover, either the Betsys knew all about the inmate, and yet did not leave the house, or knew nothing, which equally meant there was nothing to be afraid of, or knew just enough to make them shut up the room, but not enough to weigh on their spirits. In any of these cases, it seemed that not much was to be feared, and certainly, so far, he had had no sort of ugly experience. On the whole, the line of least resistance was to stay. Well, he stayed out his week. Nothing took him past that door, and often he would pause in a quiet hour of day or night in the passage and listen, and listen. No sound whatever issued from that direction. You might have thought that Thompson would have made some attempt at ferreting out stories connected with the inn. Hardly, perhaps, from the Betsys, but from the parson of the parish, or old people in the village. But no, the reticence which commonly falls on people who have had strange experiences, and believe in them, was upon him. Nevertheless, as the end of his stay drew near, his yearning after some kind of explanation grew more and more acute. On his solitary walks he persisted in planning out some way, the least obtrusive, of getting another daylight glimpse into that room, and eventually arrived at this scheme. He would leave by an afternoon train, about four o'clock. When his fly was waiting and his luggage on it, he would make one last expedition upstairs to look round his own room and see if anything was left unpacked. And then, with that key, which he had contrived to oil, as if that made any difference, the door should once more be opened, for a moment, and shut. So it worked out. The bill was paid, the consequent small talk gone through while the fly was loaded. Pleasant part of the country, but very comfortable. Thanks to you and Mrs. Betts. Hope to come back some time. On one side. On the other, very glad you found satisfaction, sir. Done our best. Always glad to have your good word. Very much favored. We've been with the weather, to be sure. Then, I'll just take a look upstairs in case I've left a book or something out. No, don't trouble. I'll be back in a minute. And as noiselessly as possible, he stole to the door and opened it. The shattering of the illusion. Propped, or you might say sitting, on the edge of the bed was nothing in the round world but a scarecrow. A scarecrow out of the garden, of course, dumped into the deserted room. Yes, but here amusement ceased. Have scarecrows bare bony feet? Do their heads loll on their shoulders? Have they iron collars and links of chain about their necks? Can they get up and move? if never so stiffly, across a floor, with wagging heads and arms close at their sides, and shiver? The slam of the door, the dash to the stairhead, the leap downstairs, were followed by a faint. Awakening, Thompson saw Betts standing over him with the brandy bottle and a very reproachful face. You shouldn't have done so, sir. Really, you shouldn't. It ain't a kind way to act by persons, as done the very best they could for you. Thompson heard words of this kind, but what he said in reply he did not know. Mr. Betts, and perhaps even more Mrs. Betts, found it hard to accept his apologies, and his assurances that he would say no word that could damage the good name of the house. However, they were accepted. Since the train could not now be caught... It was arranged that Thompson should be driven to the town to sleep there. Before he went, the Betzes told him what little they knew. They say he was a landlord here a long time back, and was in with the highwaymen that had their beat about the earth. That's how he come by his end. Ung in chains, they say, up where you see that stone where the gallows stood in. Yes, the fishermen made their way with that. I believe, because they see it out at sea and keep the fish off, according to their idea. Yes, we had the account from the people that had the house before we come. You keep that room shut up, they says. 
but don't move the bed out, and you'll find there won't be no trouble. And no more there eyes been. Not once he haven't come out into the house, though what he may do now there ain't no saying. Anyway, you're the first I knowed it's seen him since we've been here. I never set eyes on him myself, nor don't want. And ever since we've made the servants' rooms in the stabling, we ain't had no difficulty that way. Only I do hope, sir, as you'll keep a close tongue, considering how and house do get talked about with more to this effect. The promise of silence was kept for many years. The occasion of my hearing the story at last was this, that when Mr. Thompson came to stay with my father, it fell to me to show him to his room, and instead of letting me open the door for him, he stepped forward and threw it open himself and then for some moments stood in the doorway, holding up his candle and looking narrowly into the interior. Then he seemed to recollect himself and said, I beg your pardon. Very absurd, but I can't help doing that for a particular reason. What that reason was, I heard some days afterwards, and you have heard now. <laughs> Frightful Tales was read by Blair Mello and James Mayo and was introduced by David Duchesne. It was engineered and edited by Brick Salter and Chris Lusser and directed by Larry Carney. Blue Diamond Audiobooks is a division of PC Treasures, Inc., a multi-murder uh, media entertainment company. <laughs>